With your help, we can continue to fight for freedom, reach new audiences, and bring important information to the public free of charge. This is not possible without your generosity. Join our quest for the truth and our freedom and donate today. Simply go to tntradio.live. Germ Warfare is Jeremy Nell on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. It is a hot day here at the bottom tip of the African continent. Global warming, global warming has arrived, at least for the next few months before it becomes global cooling. Uh, but don't tell the IPCC that because uh, they don't want you to know that winter happens once a year. They don't want you to know that uh, Europe is pretty cold at the moment. Uh, but, you know, who, who cares? As long as we can maintain narratives, hey? Maintain narratives for mass surveillance and mass control. That's what it, it's all about when you're at that sort of, when you're playing in the uh, game of hierarchies, global hierarchies, global stakeholder capitalism, you know, all, all the usual things that we've been experiencing in the last three years. Drop me an email, jimwarfare at tntradio.live. Uh, let me know where in the world you are mailing me from. I love knowing that it's actually it's actually my favorite part. I don't care all that much about what you have to say. I just like knowing where you are. It's a lot of fun. I think the most interesting place so far uh, is somebody listening from Bermuda. Um, I remember growing up, Bermuda, or at least the Triangle, was this alien UFO affair. I think there were TV shows about it, what was happening there. I don't know if any of that stuff is even legit or real anymore. All I know is that there apparently were some planes that went down in that region. I'm going back quite a few decades now. I can't quite remember the whole thing. But yes, yeah, somebody was listening uh, from Bermuda. So I found that pretty interesting. Okay. <laughs> My name is Jim. This is Jim Warfare, the Battle of Ideas. Real political talk. Party politics is killing our government. Today's News Talk Radio. TNT. Matt Eret, thank you for joining me in the trenches. What do you know about Bermuda or the Triangle? And that's that's not something that's one in my blind spot. Unfortunately, I don't know very much. <laughs> I think I saw an episode of uh, Unexplained Mysteries when I was a kid, and uh, yeah, I have no idea though. No idea. <laughs> well, at least you aren't in Bermuda. You're in the states, aren't you? I'm in Canada. Why did I think you're in the states? Uh, I'm so American sorry. accent. I've got an Americanized accent. And watched a lot of Simpsons, so maybe that's that's what threw you in there. But yes, I'm, I'm actually. That's I'm, why. Yeah. Now I'm the editor. Of the, the the magazine I run is actually the Canadian uh, Patriot Review, and I'm based uh, just south yes. of Montreal in a yes. firm firm country. Well, tell you what. How about I say this? You all look and sound the same. <laughs> <laughs> I can say the same about weird. Jeff. <laughs> I can say the same about Jeff. All Aussies look and sound the same too. <laughs> you know, uh, people hate it when you say that because they 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 get all defensive. It's obviously a joke. <laughs> hey, yeah, people are too touchy there. Uh, their nerves are all exposed. <laughs> but I will say this though: um, Canada looks pretty cold right now. It's chilly. It's chilly. We've been through a couple of couple snowstorm so far but um yeah the uh the the idea that global warming is really an issue is uh becoming a harder and harder sell although uh, a lot of lemmings are still holding on to it despite that why do you think that is there's just a uh, why did why did people Propaganda. allow blood why did people allow bloodletting for for a few centuries as a uh uh a remedy for all sorts of common colds and illnesses and, and everything else that, you know, there, there's a certain, there's a lack of ability to think for oneself and, uh, and a lack of ability to question expert authority by using your own sovereign reasoning. It's just, it's, it's a highly dampened, reduced power in our, our current society, unfortunately. Mm. Just quickly before I actually, I actually chat to you about what I wanted you on, uh, Mike, who's listening right now from Bermuda is engaging in the live chat. <laughs> he says there are over 300 shipwrecks and some planes <laughs> around the area that it makes for great diving. <laughs> well, it's a good answer, finally. well thank you for diving. that, Mike. Well, 
where do we start? I last chatted to you about that fantastic documentary. Um, I'll tell you what, let me start with the same quote that I used last time, because it really is, it really is a very beautiful sentence. Know thyself, nothing to excess, surety brings ruin. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, we're, we're referring to a, a new documentary that I made with my wife. Um, that is the inscription at the Temple of Delphi. That's something which anybody who wants to get a uh, prescription as a general or as a king from the gods of, of the god of Apollo through the voice of a doped up young girl uh, about 2,500 years ago. Anybody who wanted to know whether they should go to war, declare peace, whatever policy they should do, they all had to first confer with the god Apollo. And her, this, this poor girl's mutterings were uh, were interpreted by a grouping of high priests operating in a sort of proto freemasonic fashion um they would give the uh the prescription in favor for gold and that way uh they would be able to control all sides of pretty much every conflict that ever happened going into the one of the points of seduction that gave them the image of wisdom was this inscription which was a very true inscription i mean no one can say that that what you just read there is not true but um of course it a lie can only be accepted if it has the appearance of truth. So um, if they just said, stop thinking for yourself, follow whatever the priesthood says, and even if it sounds irrational, do it anyway, um, people wouldn't pay the money and go to war and destroy kingdoms. And in that documentary, we, we sort of, Cynthia, my wife, who, who authored the script, takes a, uh, a case study of the figure of uh, King Croesus of Lydia, who had his whole kingdom destroyed by following the the prescriptions of the uh, the cult of Delphi at Apollo, um, or the cult of Apollo at Delphi, and uh, and went to war unnecessarily, or at least in a stupid way with Persia, probably necessary, but in a stupid way. Though uh, all evidence points to the fact that Persia also operated via the um, or it was interfacing with the cult of Apollo or at Delphi as well. So basically, that's it. It's called the Delphic the Delphic method sell sell a lie via the appearance of truth and that could take a variety of forms and that was the form it took at that period in, in world history and this sort of sets the foundation for america's secret history doesn't it well it sort of gives it's a nice jump jump off point to get across the um uh, the, the technique that has led to the undermining of America's sovereignty over the past 250 or so years, um, since these techniques that utilize uh, coded messaging, secret societies, rights of initiation, mystery schools, was embedded and in, enshrined within um, a certain secret policing function that was created or established by British United Loyalists or British Empire Loyalists. Um, who worked on behalf of the City of London British Intelligence and remained in the United States, especially in South Carolina. Um, the figure of Augustine Prevost was a key figure who set up that apparatus, which became the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry and, and operated with very similar principles of, of operation, though obviously 2000 plus years had elapsed in between. And uh, these, these mystery religions and secret societies had, had adapted or morphed uh, slightly, let's just say that, uh, in between that period. But yeah, the, the essence, the essential characteristic is is there for how, how the U.S. was undermined. A lot of that morphing that you refer to, though, was that a combination of design and emergence? Well, it, it's it's adaptive in a sense. I mean, the, the oligarchy is many things, creative they are not, but they are adaptive in a Darwin in sense so um, the world changes and the oligarchy tries like a parasite to hang on and and will have to adapt or be thrown off uh as a parasite that it is from humanity so it's pretty good at latching on um so of course during the roman empire that really you know became hegemonic after after athens went through its downfall and again the cult of delphi was there the whole time overseeing the the corruption and destruction from the inside of athens um, over the course of the Roman Empire, you had the cult of Delphi again operating under a slightly different way with things like the Sibylline books, which were the uh, 15 books that were interpreted by a committee of 15 that were the utterings of Apollo written down and scribed and then interpreted by the committee of 15, which maintained the various licensed sanctioned cults for the elites and for the masses. It again operated, it, it controlled the Senate. The Senate had to confer with them. Um, and you had a whole network of 
things like the cult of Mithra Mitre, the cult of Sibel, various cult. It was an, it was a, an empire of cults that organized the growth of this behemoth uh, monstrosity of the Roman Empire into its worst, you know, into its worst components, especially in, until it collapsed. Afterwards, you know, the, the oligarchy migrated um, to a variety of places through the Vatican, especially into Venice, and interfaced mm -hmm. to again reconstitute itself after Rome's collapse. Um, so these, these mystery religions took on a slightly different form. Um, you know, certain grand strategists like uh, Bernard de Clairvaux was a, a founder of the Knights Templar and uh, in so doing set up a new version of this secret society with a Manichaean dualism that worshipped a form of Lucifer, it seems, that did various ritualistic uh, occult practices that oversaw as well the, uh, the Crusades. They had a base of operations in Jerusalem. Um, this destroyed Europe, turned Europe into a complete basket case for a few centuries, uh, created a clash of civilizations. It reconstituted itself again under the Rosicrucian order, um, especially as it was, you know, we saw a, a migration of the oligarchy's operations from Venice into um, Britain. Um, a lot of this utilized people like John D. Robert Flood, um, Francesco Zorzi, who controlled, he was an advisor to Henry VIII and induced Henry VIII to basically destroy all alliances that he had had and create a new church for himself. It oversaw the creation of the Jesuit order as well as a sub-branch within the Vatican. And uh, and yeah, we had a, just a, a refinement and a refinement with branches in France, with branches in various parts that then took on the form we know it under the Scottish Rite in the uh, 19th century. Okay, I want to chat a little a bit more about the Scottish Rite, but uh, uh, I'm having some audio issues with you. So Jeff just quickly wants me to cut to break and, and chat to you about this. I'll be back with you now. TNT Radio's Dirk Pullman. As an expert in international law, what's your position on Julian Assange's case? I am a uh, uh, great admirer of Julian Assange, as I am an admirer of Edward Snowden and of other whistleblowers. Since uh, my time uh, as a UN staff member, and I was for decades a senior lawyer, with the United Nations uh, and the High Commissioner for Human Rights here in Geneva, I have been pleading for the drafting and adoption of a Charter of Rights of uh, whistleblowers, because I think that uh, whistleblowers are eminent human rights defenders. We need them desperately because our governments lie to us. Our governments commit war crimes and crimes against humanity in our names. And we don't know about it because secrecy is the key. The Dirk Pullman Show on today's News Talk, TNT Radio. A better business tip from TNT Radio. One reason people tune in to TNT Radio is often because they're loyal to a specific show or personality. Our personalities have been a part of people's daily routine and people continue to tune in. They trust TNT Radio and are highly engaged with the content. If you'd like more information about advertising on TNT Radio, simply fill out your details on our contact page and we'll be in touch. To find out more, go to tntradio.live. Who is this? Who are you? Who are you? Tell us. Today's News Talk Radio. TNT. All right, Matt, back with you. Um, so how important... Um, is the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry when it comes to the sort of subversive origins of the, uh, you know, the the secret police of America? Well, extremely, extremely important. I mean, in the original early days of America, there were, um, I mean, many people often try to oversimplify uh, Freemasonry into a one-size-fits-all narrative, and that's impossible to do. You had various diverse Masonic lodges um, some of which were operated by humanists who were willing to give their lives for an ideal of humanity as made as something that was in the image of a living and a good creator. Um, this was partially that something that helped keep um, transmissions of information planning secret, especially within the, the, the 13 colonies, but also across the ocean with um, groupings that were working with the American patriots in France and Spain and Ireland, even in Russia and in in, in in, in India, I should say. Um, so you did have some positive Masonic lodges at an early point or a late point in the 18th century, and that continued in the case of the United States into the early part of the 19th century, maybe a little bit after that, a little bit. But um, as we saw with the case 
of uh, of uh, Schenkenator's lodges in Vienna, which were operated by humanists. Uh, many of them were assassinated, were purged under the uh, the chaos of the, the Napoleonic Wars that were made possible by, again, British manipulation and various other warring factions within the, the Masonic lodges within France and within Britain that cr- that turned the French Revolution into a blood, bloody but bloodbath of uh, of Jacobin terror instead of some instead of it being a model of the U.S. Revolution, which was a much more su- successful experience. The French one turned into a disaster. Napoleon was introduced to fill a, a vacuum of leadership and created twenty years of of chaos. Um, during that chaos, like I said, the, organ- the oligarchy reorganized much of its its control systems and purged various lodges, most all lodges, I think, from Europe of any um, healthy humanist th- thinkers. It, these groups did persevere a little bit longer in the United States' uh, experience, but only a little bit. Um, and uh, the, the, the Scottish Rite, which had a, a northern and a, and a southern branch, the southern branch was, I think, the most virulent. Um, was, as I mentioned, constituted by the sea policing apparatus that was established by Augustine Prevo, who worked for the British Empire against the American patriots, um, his followers. They were all Masonic, but they created and established the Scottish Rite with, with a particular version of the rites of initiation that were a little bit more, I think, explicit in their Luciferianism. Um, this is something that you don't see very easily, and, and you can only sort of get inklings at it when you read Morals and Dogma that was later written by a Scottish Rite leader, uh, Albert Pike, who reorganized the operation yet again and established it at the center of a new intelligence apparatus after the Civil War to help re-empower the slave power that had, had taken a big hit um, you know, by the end of, uh, of 1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, so the Scottish Rite, it's, it's been there growing and growing. And I think today it is the dominant of the American lodges that has taken over control. I mean, it was there at the very origins of the FBI. Um, it was there, uh, I mean, you'll, you'll find much of the US intelligence community is controlled by this, this apparatus. There might be players here or there, but it's, it's uh, at the heart of the real takeover by the each state throughout the 20th century in the case of the USA. Can it uh, be stated then that the FBI has been a shadow government of the US for, for decades? It's, I would say it's been the a, a tool utilized by this shadow government mm. to exert influence over a system that uh, is to be controlled. So, I mean, you know, I, I don't think itself is, a, it's not making center in and of itself. It's just one of many weapons and a powerful weapon at that, that was created by a fellow named Charles Bonaparte, who was the attorney general mm-hmm. under, under Teddy Roosevelt, who himself uh, was into very, very many Freemasonic operations. Um, people like, you know, uh, Attorney General Palmer under Woodrow Wilson, who recruited young um, J. Edgar Hoover, both thirty third, uh, both thirty third degree uh, Freemasons under the Scottish Rite, um, continued to grow this thing. But it really just became like it was during World War One and a little bit afterwards. You know, it was an organization that created uh, an atmosphere of fear, paranoia, blackmail as well. You and it was used to. In, in the first Red Scare um, that was spreading, and again, spreading largely because of propaganda being unleashed onto the American psyche and people by the same FBA uh, apparatus that said, you know, the, you've got these commies that are trying to create a Bolshevik revolution in America, mm-hmm. and we have to purge, thus, any patriot from academia or from government or from unions. And what we saw was a takeover of many unions, um, especially th- during the 20s, because of the purging of these patriots by um, organized crime increasingly in the 20s and 30s that became the basis of bootlegging, prostitution, drug running, and that was always interfacing very closely with these intelligence agencies. And people like Whitney Webb wrote remarkable works like her new book on uh, one nation going through the interfacing of American intelligence and uh, and mafia organized crime. This, you know, doesn't really go into the Freemasonic element, but you, you ha- do have to look at that as a point of causal nexus that allowed for the growth 
of this pl- this parasite and this corruption over the course of uh, the 20th century, most most certainly. Okay, Matt, uh, Jeff wants to uh, try again and fix your your line. There's some there's some gremlin in the system, so I'm going to quickly cut to uh, Jeff. Are we going to do headlines or break? Whichever. But I'll, I'll be back with you shortly, Matt. Question. Huh? What are you guys doing today? The news. TNT Radio News. Sounds good. Darren Metzer here with a look at your TNT Radio News headlines. Donald Trump's company was convicted of tax fraud on Tuesday in a case brought by the Manhattan District Attorney. The guilty verdict came on the second day of deliberations. The relentless eruption of the world's largest active volcano has prompted Hawaii's National Guard to step in, as residents and tourists flock to see it. And Uber has been fined $21 million by the Australian Federal Court for misleading customers about their fare estimates and trip cancellation fees. Globalist agendas, democratic rights at risk, corruption, propaganda, it never stops. For the news and views silenced by the mainstream media, by government and corporations, vote one. TNT Radio, free speech always has a home here. Stay up to date with the latest live news and current affairs, delivered by our lineup of expert commentators and hosts. Listen to TNT Radio anywhere you go. Ask Alexa or Google to play TNT Radio, or download the TNT Radio app for free from the App Store or Google Play. Today's news talk, this is TNT Radio. Okay, so you mentioned you mentioned Albert Pike. He's he's a pretty big deal. Um and J. Edgar Hoover is also a pretty big deal in the story of the US, isn't it? Uh yeah, most most certainly. Um well, he, uh, I mean Albert Pike himself was the figure who probably did the most to reorganize this secret policing apparatus. Um, in 1871, he was a Confederate general. A lot of people forget that. He was a, a key figure within the Confederacy, within mm. the, the, the British-directed, and it was a British imperial-directed war uh, to undermine the United States from within. Uh, that was the Civil War. He was a correspondent as well of uh, Giuseppe Mazzini, the, the leader of the Young Europe movements that had learnt or at least applied a technique of weaponizing young disenfranchised people into mass weapons in order to undermine target nations and destroy any potential viable revolutionary capacities within societies. And this has become young, young, young England, young Germany, young Spain, young Russia, there is young America branches. And again, this was deployed it on behalf and with a direction by Lord Palmerston of the British Foreign Office during the 1840s, 50s. And Albert Pike was a leading figure within the Young America groupings. Um, in his correspondences, he describes uh, the importance of recognizing uh, Lucifer as the only true uh, god to be worshipped in their Manichaean um, dualistic worldview. Um, so even to this very day, there's a bust of Albert Pike, and his in, and he's tombed entombed in the Washington. Mm-hmm. I believe it's the Washington, but it might be another. Yeah, I believe it's the Washington Scottish Rite Lodge. And in that same lodge, you also have. Um, J. Edgar Hoover's a replica of his of his office, um, who was considered their second most important member, as we go through in that documentary we're referencing. And J. Edgar Hoover himself, yeah, he called his office the seat of government. He he had a white Masonic lodge as well, just to get across that the 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 racist um, components of what Albert Pike represented. And keep in mind also, Albert Pike was a co-founder of things like the Knights of the Golden Circle, according to the, right, the research by Anton Chaikin, uh, as well, which became the KKK as a domestic-controlled terrorist apparatus. Um, so the, the fact that out Jared Hoover installed a white Masonic branch called the Fidelity uh, Chapter is also very important, and it, it, he presided over eight presidencies, you know, so he's been there for a long mm-hmm. time. And he himself participated in many of these blackmail operations, creating forgery, forged documents to try to destroy the lives of people who were patriots in America, who resisted the policies of the Cold War and other things. Um, and he himself was, in some ways, uh, you know, a cross-dressing homosexual freak who, you know, had tons of escapades and a variety of things and had a lot of blackmail held against him. But he was a proud 33rd degree member of the Scottish right. And, and that has to be kept in mind when you're thinking about J. Edgar Hoover's psychology, what was the apparatus he represented, and again, eight presidencies. Uh, he was there for a very long time. Do you think 
J. Edgar Hoover saw himself as a good man? Um, we, we all tell little lies to ourself, uh, ourselves, and I think that J. Edgar Hoover told very big lies to himself. He probably did on some level, but I would, like, I would imagine that in his, in his conscience when he went to bed, he knew that he was lying to himself. I mean, the amount of evil that he had to oversee and do, um, you can only justify that away to a certain extent. And I mean, as we get through in that little mini documentary, there's a lot, of, there's a lot more we could have said, but he certainly was a key player overseeing the murder of people like, the, uh, like a, a, a Senator Thomas J. Walsh, one of his key enemies who oversaw the, uh, the Senate committee investigations into the abuses of the Palmer raid that he, uh, he Hoover had participated in that I mentioned earlier. Um, he, so, I mean, Senator Palmer was a, a key ally of Franklin Roosevelt's, <clears throat> who uh, was about to become made Attorney General of the United States in 1933, and, and he died the very day that he was supposed to, you know, uh, be, become the Attorney General, where he said he was going to purge the FBI, he was going to uh, fire Hoover. So all of these things didn't happen. He oversaw the murder of John F. Kennedy, who we, we get at a few of the stories that Hoover uh, had participated in. And we could also probably say the same for his brother, Bobby Kennedy. Hoover, tried, Hoover worked very hard to destroy the life of MLK and probably, and not probably, actually, a, 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 a state jury in, I believe it was Tennessee in 1989, ruled in favor of the King family, uh, Credit Scott King, that J. Edgar Hoover and the U.S. government had overseen a conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King. Um, a lot of other things. I mean, we, we again go through a list of maybe eight or nine examples of the sorts of evil that J. Edgar Hoover had to, over, uh, had to participate in. Um, so I don't think he could necessarily, like I said, go to bed at night with a clean conscience mm -hmm. and think that he was the good guy ultimately, but he did tell himself that, yes. Is it true that he saw his um, uh, chair, so to speak, in the FBI as, quote unquote, the seat of government? Yeah, yeah, he certainly did uh, say that on record to various members of his inner circle that he wanted fellow FBI agents to refer to him as the, his office as the seat of government. Um, that that is, yeah, that is something that he he enjoyed. He saw himself as power behind or and above all thrones. Um, but at the same time, too, I, I think he was aware that he was being blackmailed throughout most of his life because of his disturbing fetishes and uh as whitney webb even gets to, gets that in her books i just had a conversation with her uh, yesterday you know uh, he ended up really um identifying with his controllers and his handlers and became an open participant in many of these you know pedophilia and mesh parties walking around publicly in not publicly publicly but walking around within these inner circles within these different groups and parties that happen at things like the the blue suite uh, in Washington, uh, I, you know, in full women's garb and high heels. Um, mm. So he was, he really embraced that uh, putrid cultural lifestyle of the, the inner, uh, the shadow government, so to speak, you know? And so, but yeah, he, he saw his seat as the, as the seat of government. Yeah. You mentioned the Kennedys. Was JFK a threat to Hoover? Yeah, very much so. I mean, people can, there's, there's so many points one could run with there, but, uh, I mean, a lot of people latch on to his famous secret society speech that we, we introduced at the end of that, that film in honor of, or memory of JFK. But if you look at everything he was doing, um, since you got to keep in mind, the FBI was sort of the internal domestic police apparatus, kind of like a model of what MI5 was while the CIA was created after World War II, modeled on more the MI6 foreign uh, policing agency, all, all um, covert, obviously. And they both worked hand in hand to, on the one hand, reconquer the U.S. from within to create this, this F and that was the FBI's primary task, although they had foreign operation divisions like Division 5, um, carrying out assassinations and other international operations. But that was mostly international with the CIA's primary jurisdiction, although the CIA did operate internally within the U U.S. borders as well, but, uh, but they interfaced closely to turn the U.S. increasingly into an empire. 
into a, a battering ram or a weapon on behalf of British imperial interests, which were always at the heart of the U.S. deep state. It was never an American institution, this deep state thing that people have, have come to call it. So JFK went to war on both ends. He primarily took out first, you know, Alan Dulles, as well as Alan Dulles' second in command at the CIA, and, you know, famously said we, we need to um, basically shatter this, this agency and, split and, and blow it into the wind. He called for retracting the U.S. out of, or extracting the U.S. out of its commitments into Vietnam that Alan Dulles and, and other agents operating within U.S. foreign policy circles had, had enmeshed the U.S. at that time. He called for breaking up um, many of the shackles that were being um, created financially, like the Federal Reserve, and, and creating a situation where U.S. Congress and the Treasury would be more uh, in control of their financial destiny. And these are things that he did on a mul multitude of levels, both to create infrastructure projects within the United States, large-scale science and technology with, with a long-term multi-generational view as part of a rehabilitation of the morals and, and physical economic uh, powers of the USA. That was very important to, to rebuild the moral fiber of, of America because that's the only way you can have a, a democracy function is if you have people thinking multi-generational and with, with capacities of, of creation, not just consumption, which is... You, at the heart of the, the corruption that we've fallen into for the past 50 plus years. And yeah, I mean, he definitely was making decisions outside of the threats of JFK who tried to, to create uh, art, you know, different proofs that he was having sex with Marilyn Monroe or, you know, different things that were taking them, the, the McMillan government at the time, like the Profumo affair. They were just making up all sorts of points of evidence to try to enmesh Kennedy and then threaten him. But in my research, I've seen no evidence that any of this is actually real. A lot of this just seems like forgery. He doesn't seem to be as promiscuous as many of these, uh, these figures who are still, to this very day, trumping J. Edgar Hoover propaganda pieces. People still believe that JFK was this womanizing freak. And again, when you look at the actual hard evidence, it all just comes out of JFK's, uh, J. Edgar Hoover's offices. And same thing for Martin Luther King. I mean, you can't find any actual hard evidence that he was this womanizing thing, but they were making up tapes and other things with, you know, and, and saying, oh, yeah, that's obviously Martin Luther, Luther King's voices or voice with, you know, God, lo God knows how many women that he's sleeping with. But there, there's no evidence that any of that wasn't just made up. It doesn't even sound like him, according to Coretta Scott King, who listened to it. So, yeah, I mean... Uh, Jared Hoover's deployment was to destroy anybody who was a threat to this international Anglo-American fascist apparatus, both either within the USA or, or internationally. And JFK had a very strong intention to revive Franklin Roosevelt's uh, mission to destroy imperialism by helping African nations, Asian, uh, South American nations, develop full-spectrum uh, heavy industry, large-scale infrastructure, and stand on their own two feet, which they were not allowed to do under empire. So these were this made JFK a great threat, and as did his brother. Uh, so I'm getting the impression that the FBI, uh, uh, you know, along with uh, Hoover, they were not loyal to the U.S. <laughs> no, no, they weren't. Who were they loyal to? Well, it's uh, this is the the old oligarchical uh, systems, the old the old bloodlines and families and their institutions, which go back to the days of the ancient Roman Empire and probably Babylon before that. Um, we're we're dealing with a continuity. I mean, today uh, on this earth, there's there's a, a nested grouping of of families. Some some call them the black nobility. Um, I'm not, I'm not talking about the. Uh, some African kings here. It's like the the old terms for the the old nobility of of these bloodlines in Europe, um, which operated through things like the Habsburg agencies of the Spanish or the Austrian Habsburgs. So, I mean, the Habsburgs were pretty omnipotent for a few centuries. Um, at a certain point, um, another family faction, which uh, ended up becoming more dominant, had centered around the uh, the uh, the you know, the British Isles and uh, Britain increasingly became the center of this, of this family, uh, <laughs> this, this family foundation, I guess you could call it, um, and became the dominant, the dominant uh, set, especially um, 
after I think the 1716 period, um, when a German family was was brought in. But ultimately, these families themselves are often not in control of anything. You have a higher agency that controls and manages the behavior of various families that are themselves beholden to their trusts, to their um, to these different um, Masonic groups that that are managed by certain um, higher operatives or grand strategists that manage the trust, the family fortunes, the, the property rights that maintain the continuity of power over many generations. But it, it's still, it's an old European thing. It's not an American thing. America was set up as, an, as a different type of nation originally, and it's embedded in, in the Constitution, right? Anybody who reads that beautiful, it's beautiful uh, founding documents, especially the Declaration of Independence, um, we'll see very clearly that, that the U.S. is premised around a rejection of heredit- her, uh, hereditary power, and it's the first nation that enshrined the idea that every individual was sovereign because we're all made in the image of a living God, and that's where rights come from. They're not given to us by a sovereign. And so that was a big revolutionary idea, uh, which it still is to this very day, obviously. And that's what had to be destroyed before it became too... Uh, before it spread too widely around the world, because if people woke up to that reality, um, if that, that, that had successfully spread in France, for example, and France had not become a Jacobin terror bloodbath, but rather had actually successfully become a real Republican society, that would have been a springboard for various other groups that were organized by Benjamin Franklin, who were prepared to then take it into Poland in the 1780s, in the 1790s. Um, into Ireland, where there's a, a robust Republican uh, movement that had worked with Ben Franklin's networks in America and, and Spain and, and many places even in South America and beyond. Even Hyder Ali, like I said, the Muslim leader of, uh, of southern India, who was fighting the British in the 1780s and 90s with his, with his son Tipu Sultan, um, had written letters to the, the Continental Congress saying, our fight is your fight, we are, our fight is one to create a new humanity. So it was a very beautiful idea, and, it, and like I said, it, the fight is still underway. It's, it's in no way over, but, uh, but the FBI and all these things were always just instruments controlled by this older, ancient family bloodline who just are refusing to, to let go of their utopic idea of ret- restoring feudalism, effectively. All right, I think I have to do my last ad break, so um, I will be back with you shortly, Matt. Challenging the consensus and debunking the narrative, this is Viewpoint. Who is Klaus Schwab and what is the World Economic Forum which he leads? Just quoting Klaus Schwab is alarming enough. If he and his billionaire friends achieved their great reset, tyranny would be the new world order. Born in Ravensburg, Germany in 1938, Klaus Schwab is a child of Adolf Hitler's Third Reich, a political state regime built on fear and violence, on brainwashing and control, on propaganda and lies. While the Nazis desired a new order for Germany that would last a thousand years, Klaus Schwab's vision extends globally and would potentially be unstoppable were nations to relinquish all sovereignty and adopt the neurotechnologies and biotechnologies which forces us, in the words of Klaus Schwab, to question what it means to be human. When the forgotten poor are in need of healing, they wait for a ship unlike any other. Mercy Ships, a floating hospital staffed by volunteers, heroes of mercy who donate their time to save lives. Every human has the right to have a place at the table of the human race. If you could just see the smiles that you get when lives have been changed, then it would make it all worth it. To learn more about Heroes of Mercy, go to mercyships.org. Stop the jab and save lives. The COVID vaccine does not work. Today's News Talk, TNT Radio. Matt, um, you know, it, it, it's weird to me that that so many people are just not waking up. Uh, how? How do we, do we just have to just keep having these conversations? Well, I, I think that's... Yeah, we do we need to keep having these conversations, I think. And, um, you know, that that's one thing about crises, real objective crises do have mm-hmm. within them the seats for renewal. Um, it's <laughs> unfortunately something which is usually only tapped into as a power by um, 
those arsonists who created the crisis to begin with and would like to impose some order out of chaos. Um, that's, that's often been the case. However, when you realize after a long slumber that um, your house is actually on fire and you wake up to that fact, your mind is much more susceptible to self-reflection, self-examination, and looking for water. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I'm obviously seeing, and I'm sure you are as well, a vast spike around the world of people who are waking up to a much different reality than the one they thought existed maybe a couple of years ago and are yes. very hungry. I mean, the, there, there's certainly a thirst for, for deeper knowledge than people were accustomed to thinking about in their seemingly normal, you know, stable uh, identities that they thought were, <laughs> were for, forever uh, identities a few years back. Um, the question now is, do we have the, the ability to organize the minds of people to take proper responsibility? Because at the end of the day, it's not about how much information people have, right? It's about do, what, do, they, do they or do they not have the wisdom to use information in a way that bears action that is tied to um, solutions? And that's, that's the big challenge right now, because there's, there's sort of an information overload in some ways social media and other things have alternative media. It's, it's wonderful, but it's created a bit of a, um, a short attention span problem. People are just on Twitter, on, on you know, t- Telegram, whatever else, looking for little blips of, it, of data that are shocking, that, but, but don't really mobilize people's hearts and minds in a way that allows them to properly um, develop real knowledge and put that real knowledge into organized action. The way we saw with people like Martin Luther King's approach to organizing the civil rights movement, um, which which took on a, it had a much more a slightly different, more robust character. We we did see examples of that with the Freedom Convoy of Canada. We've seen examples of that emerge in our modern age, but we need to see a lot more of that. Something else that emerges from a conversation like this is that the real enemy is not who you think it is. No, not at all. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are, are because they're, they're conditioned by Hollywood images of good and evil, they don't have a proper appreciation for what these oligarchical systems actually are, which are, should be staring them in the face. It was much better understood generations ago than it is today. And so people become much more susceptible to propaganda or misinformation or psyops that are deployed into the zeitgeist to try to take a lot of truthful data about the conspiracies that are shaping our lives today and redirect the causal nexus towards a straw man like the Jews or the Russians or the Chinese are at the heart of all of the evil problems. And then people, it becomes absorbers for our faith and our fear. And then what happens is that we acquiesce to or we become instruments of that very evil which we despise by you know giving permission or support to crackdowns um, on on Jews as we see a huge renewal of that behind you know the this idea that the Jews are behind everything today and that thus you know <laughs> we just have to destroy the Jews even though the state of Israel itself was created the whole political Zionist movement was created by the same Freemasonic groups like the Nybrith that came out of. Um, the St. Albert Pike networks of the Scottish Rite, the first Benai Brith member, um, Jesuits also. was the leader of the Scottish Rite in the United States after the Civil War. Um, Lord Palmerston, who was organizing with uh, Mazzini, was a co-founder of the, the Palestinian Expedition Fund that created the basis of uh, the Zionist political, modern Zionist cause. So it's like these are playthings on a, on a grand chessboard. And again, the Chinese as the center of evil. No, I'm sorry. They're, they're at war as well with their own deep state. But the, the same operation that, that tried to wipe out China and subdue them under the opium wars is still there today, undermining it both from within and from the outside. And it's the same American uh, enemy that's out to destroy the United States. It's, uh, it's the same thing. It's the enemy within. The enemy within and without. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it can only spread by our own lack of self-awareness, self-examination. So in, in a sense, it's mm-hmm. a little, we have a little enemy <laughs> within all of us, that part of us that, that is unex- unexamined, that does not, um, that, that acts on blind assumptions, that, that, that allows convictions to form within our hearts that we didn't earn ourselves, but were put there um, from the outside. And thus, yeah, we, each, each one of us becomes our own enemy, and the, own, the enemy of our, of our nation and the enemy of humanity. 
to the degree that we allow these things to go unexplored, unexamined. Um, and we thus allow ourselves to act in a non-sovereign way. Only sovereign people <laughs> think for themselves, you know, and, and this touches back at, the, at your first question of why do people believe in global warming to this very day? Because they've been trained not to think for themselves, not to self-examine their own powers of thought. So instead, they just allow for other entities, authorities, that they don't even necessarily know their names of to think for them, and they're trained to, to do that in institutions of higher education. And then that just trickles down so that people who are just your average Joe are told, you know, you might feel really cold this winter, but it's really global warming and you have to eat bugs and, and have and utilize less heat in your house in order to save Gaia, save the planet, even though you might, you might personally not see any of the things that our experts are telling you should be the cause of you modifying everything in your life. And you're not allowed to have an opinion because you have not studied in not for nine years in higher education, getting a PhD in climate science. So slave, turn off your mind and just behave. Um, that's sort of the, the type of thing. Not, 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 <laughs> not the ethos fit for a, for a sovereign democratic society. But it seems to me that there will always be this very small contingency that will think in the way that you are suggesting. You mean like people who think for themselves? Yes. Yeah, I don't think you could ever turn it off. I mean, the, the oligarchy wants to always do the same thing, which is just make everybody mm -hmm. think that there are these, these dogs or maybe talking cows happy, like a dog is happy to receive scraps from, a, from an owner's uh, table. And when the dog is too uh, old and sick to keep alive, you, you euthanize it. Um, you don't let your dogs breed themselves and, and overgrow their population. You, you keep your populations of dogs or cows in check as a farmer does. And the cows are happy not to leave their, their estate. They just eat their cud, you know. And, and the oligarchy wants us to believe that's what we are. We're not. The fact is we are not. Some will, will, will act <laughs> and adapt to cow-like behavior of far too much. Um, that's not the case. And so I think, yeah, you, you know, at the end of the day, humans will... will Dogs and dogs and cows don't yearn for freedom in their hearts. You know, they, they don't have the powers of reason that we do to actualize freedom and organize and to, to, to thirst for something higher. So I think, yeah, I mean, the, the oligarchy is, is delusional. They're, they're trying to impose their ivory tower model onto us, onto humanity and onto the universe. They, they, you know, they have a whole cosmology where they expect the, they, they demand that the universe behave according to their own perverse inner, uh, um, insanity <laughs> and the reality is the universe seems to be organized in a much more creative beautiful harmonious way than they are willing to accept because if they did accept it they would have to change who they are and I don't think that they're even capable they don't have the, mm. the humility or the the neuroplasticity whatever you want to call it to actually change their character in accordance with a truth that would make them ironically more happy people too the oligarchy I don't think they go to the representatives of the inner factions I don't think they go to go to bed and have good dreams um, and sleep soundly. I, I think that they're, they're schismed, disassociated personalities at the, at the top of the pyramid who, are in, who induce themselves to, you know, or, or tr have trained themselves and have been trained into or, or uh, groomed into a world which is super unnatural that has you uh, find ways of finding passion and pleasure out of doing perverse things, murder, um, you know, I mean, we've all seen the stories of the pedophilia and, and other things that they do with children en masse. Um, it's not just in our, in our current age around Jeffrey Epstein. It, it, this goes back centuries and millennia as a practice. It's so unnatural. So I, I think the universe designed humanity for something better, and the, and the creator of that universe, God, created us for something of a better destiny, but we're not there yet. We, we still have to uh, mature. Okay, I've got maybe three or four minutes left. So, okay, tell me a little bit about where I can find your work and, of course, your documentary, Matt. Sure. Well, the easiest thing would be to go to the uh, the Canadian Patriot magazine. That's canadianpatriot.org. And it is very easy to find uh, by my books, by my wife's new book as well. Um, she wrote something on the... Uh, the empire on which the black sun never set on the origins of fascism um, in the 20th century, um, especially looking at the British roundtable movement, 
Cecil, Cecil Rhodes's operation, what have you, that is behind all, many of these things. So she goes through that in a, in a giant 500-page book so people can get these things on my website, including my books on the untold history of Canada as well as the Clash of the Two Americas trilogy. The, the, the documentary is very easy to find on that website as well. Uh, they can go to our Substack. Uh, so it's matthewerritt.substack.com. They can, they can follow my work that way too. And lastly, I would say the Rising Tide Foundation is a uh, more educational organization that, that my wife and I created a few years ago, which uh, has weekly seminars, workshops, a lot of cultural content. So it's more in terms of cultural warfare is where we're, we're focused on, on that front. And that's risingtidefoundation.net. So that, that gives people, I think, a lot of homework if they, if they want to dig in a little bit deeper. Okay, before I uh, say cheers to you, give me in one minute a closing thought. Well, I, I guess at the end of the day, like I said, people have to have uh, a faith inside of them that ultimately this oligarchy is itself not morally fit, you know, and, and there are useless eaters on this earth. It's just that the useless eaters are not us. It's, it's the, it's the oligarchy who are, you know, of, of people born into these families of apparent material privilege who are given no real world skills, can't do anything. None of these Royals have real world skills of any meaning. Right. But they're, they're then trying to convince us that we are the parasites and rather than the truth being, it is them that are the parasites, it is them that are the useless class, and they should be in the future, and I believe that this is going to be the case, they're maybe not them, but they're great grandkids, will actually have the, the ability to discover what it means to be a real human, developing real skills, real creative powers, and participating in a useful way to humanity. Um, and, and today I would just say, um, the, the only reason why they haven't won yet is because there is a multipolar uh, alliance of nations who are, who are doing a better job than we are in the West at extracting the deep state operations from their, their societies. It's not perfect, but the, mm. the, the battle is on in India, China, Russia, but it's a battle. And uh, that's the only thing that's kept the New World Order from imposing itself already over the past decade. So people should stop being afraid of Russia or China and, and start looking a little bit more at our own backyard and working, fighting to have policies that bring us into an alignment with these countries of Eurasia that don't want to reduce their populations and undo their ancient civilizations. And that would, that would, I think, guide a, a real modern peace movement that would be viable uh, in our, in our modern day. Yeah. And to stop that's, looking that's for the fake ten. bogeyman. Was that? And to stop looking for that fake bogeyman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. No, our enemies should Matt be, Eret. our enemies are, are yes. very clearly understood. We, we should be able to see it. Great stuff. Matt Eric, thank you for joining me in the trenches again. My pleasure. Bye. And thank you, Jeff, for keeping me going, uh, making me sound somewhat pro. Uh, don't forget to email me, germwarfare at tntradio.live. Uh, as always, let me know where you are mailing me from. Jump into the live chat um, on tntradio.live's website. I will catch you next time. I'm Adia. My name is Germ. This is Germ Warfare the battle of ideas.